Our objective here is to prove Helmholtz's second theorem. Before we begin, we have to establish a couple of definitions. Uh, the first is a vortex filament. A vortex filament is a curve drawn through a three-dimensional moving fluid which is everywhere parallel to the vorticity field. And uh, Helmholtz's first theorem showed us that a vortex filament moves with the fluid. In other words, uh, a vortex filament may twist and turn and change its shape as it moves with the flow, but it's always made up of the same fluid molecules. Now, a vortex tube is a bundle of vortex filaments, so it's sort of like a vortex filament with non-zero thickness. Um, and so this is a, a depiction of a vortex tube here, where each of the green arrows is a vortex filament. Helmholtz's second theorem has to do with the circulation around a vortex filament. Now you'll remember that the circulation is defined as a line integral of the velocity field u around a closed circuit, shown in blue here. And what Stokes' theorem tells us is that we can also represent the circulation as an area integral of the vorticity over, the, over any surface bounded by our closed circuit. And the area integral is the vorticity dotted with the outward pointing unit normal, shown here as n hat. So here is n hat. It's pointing outward from the surface bounded by our closed circuit, and it's pointing outward in the direction determined by the right-hand rule. Okay, so we're going to calculate the circulation around this vortex tube, and we're going to be concerned with a couple of different kinds of surfaces. The first surface is what I've called the side wall here. It's just the, uh, the outer wall of this vortex tube. And the second kind of surface is a cross-section. So what we're doing here is we're taking two cross-sections through the vortex tube and thus isolating a, a chunk of the vortex tube. Now the first thing we'll do is calculate the surface integral over the whole surface composed of the side walls and the two cross-sections. The two cross-sections are labeled alpha and beta and the sidewall is labeled S. So this surface integral is um, the closed surface integral of omega dotted with the normal vector at each point on the surface of this chunk of vortex tube. And by the divergence theorem, we can convert this into a volume integral over the whole volume of the vortex tube of the divergence of the vorticity. Now, you'll remember that the divergence of the vorticity is identically zero, and therefore this integral has to be zero. So when we integrate the normal component of vorticity over the whole surface area of a chunk of vortex tube, it has to come out to be zero. Now, we can also break that integral up into three parts. We can break it up into an integral over the cross-section alpha, an integral over the side wall, and an integral over the cross-section beta. So that's what I'm doing here is integrating over the cross-section alpha, the side wall, and beta, and remember that whole sum has to add up to zero. Also note that the integral over the side wall has to be zero because by definition the the, the sidewall is made up of vortex filaments, and so the vorticity field omega is always lying within the sidewall, and therefore it's perpendicular to the outward pointing unit normal, and so their dot product is zero, and so when you integrate that over the area of the sidewall, you also get zero. The result of this is that the, uh, the integral of omega dotted with the unit normal over so over a uh, cross-section beta is the negative of the same integral over cross-section alpha. Okay, so next we'll move on 
and talk about the circulations around these two cross sections. So this uh, red arrow here depicts the circulation around cross section alpha. This is the way the flow is circulating as implied by the direction of the green vorticity vectors. And then we'll also look at the circulation around the cross section beta. So the circulation around either of these cross sections again uh, oops, is given by Stokes' theorem. And here's what the circulation around cross section beta looks like. It's the line integral or the surface integral of the vorticity dotted with the outward pointing unit normal. Now we can do the same thing for the circulation around cross section alpha. It's the integral around this circuit of, uh, of u dot dx. Um, which is equal to, by Stokes' theorem, omega dotted with a normal vector. But in this case, the sense of the circulation demands that the normal vector for Stokes' theorem be pointed the opposite direction from our outward pointing unit normal that we had defined before. So it's negative n hat alpha, and that means that the circulation at uh, integrated around cross section alpha is actually negative omega dot n alpha uh, integrated over the surface. Okay, so now let's put those two results together and find that the circulation around cross section alpha, which is minus this integral, has to be equal to plus the integral over the beta surface, which is the circulation over the cross-section beta. In other words, the circulations over these two cross-sections are the same. Now these two cross-sections, alpha and beta, were chosen arbitrarily, which means then that the circulation around any cross-section is the same. And this is Helmholtz's second theorem. It says for a vortex tube in an inviscid homogeneous fluid, the circulation around every cross-section is the same. So we could take a cross-section uh, here, or a cross-section there, or a cross-section like that, and we would always calculate the same circulation. Helmholtz's theorem has a couple of interesting corollaries. Uh, one of them, the first, is that thinner parts of a vortex tube have stronger vorticity. And that's because the circulation has to be the same everywhere and the circulation is the integral of the vorticity through the cross-section. So if the cross-sectional area is smaller, the vorticity has to be larger to compensate. So thin areas have relatively strong vorticity, thicker areas have relatively weak vorticity. Second interesting corollary of Helmholtz's second theorem is that a vortex tube cannot terminate except at a boundary. So it can't just peter out in the middle of the fluid because its circulation can't change. And therefore the circulation can't just go to zero somewhere uh, as you would expect if at the end of a vortex tube. So only at a boundary can a vortex tube terminate. Um, but within the, within the flow, a vortex tube can loop around itself and, and make a closed circuit so that it doesn't have any uh, beginning or end. And this results in a toroidal vortex tube. And a, uh, a familiar example of this is a smoke ring. So toroidal vortices, vortex tubes can exist, or vortex tubes can terminate at a boundary, and, uh, and those are the corollaries of Helmholtz's second theorem.